Successful Minds with Patricia Barnowski Schneider, the show that takes you around the world to share interviews with some of the most successful and relevant people on the planet. Hear their stories and get the most important business lessons they have learned on their road to success and get exclusive advice on how to implement their success into your life and business. Successful Minds with Patricia Barnowski Schneider is brought to you by the Strategic Advisor Board and your host, Patricia Barnowski Schneider. Hello and welcome back to Successful Minds. I'm your host, Patty Baranowski Schneider. Today I'm joined by Raghu Kumar, the founder and CEO of Trading Moves. So welcome, Raghu. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Yeah, you know, first of all, thanks for inviting me on this podcast. I don't do a lot of these, so hopefully it goes okay. Um, (laughs) So yeah, you know, basically, you know, I've been around the financial markets for like my entire professional life. Um, Started trading um professionally at the age of 21 um i'm 38 now so for the past 17 years i've just been actively involved with the financial markets um i've been an entrepreneur you know started trading my own capital and then i moved to india in 2009 and i set up a successful stock brokerage in india mm-hmm. called upstocks which is basically like a robin hood for india Right. Um, and then I moved back to the U.S. in 2019, took a small, somat- uh, a small sabbatical, and then I basically started Trading Leagues in 2021. So Trading Leagues is basically like a, like a, a fantasy gaming application for the financial markets. So our users come in, they play games against each other involving cryptos, stocks and Forex. Um, in a skills-based environment with the ability to make money as well. Nice. So that's like the one-minute elevator pitch, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. I know the financial yeah. markets, they're a tricky beast. So I, I've been in the financial markets for 35 years and definitely a beast all its own. So that's actually awesome that you kind of create a little fun way around it. <laughs> How you mm-hmm. make money, which is awesome. Yeah, and and, and that's really you know one of the major pain points because we associate the financial markets as being very stressful and risky and even lonely, right? When you think about actively trading through a stock brokerage, it's basically you against the markets, right? It's not you against other human beings, right? Um, We don't think of it as, you know, me participating against other people. It's me against this interface, which is showing me real-time prices. So even psychologically, we feel like it's us versus them. so on trading leagues, it's actually you against other people. And because it's a gamified and it's hyper social, um, a lot of our users kind of come in with the, the intent of having fun and enjoying a gamified experience, right? Which is very different from what we normally think about when we think about the financial markets. So, You're yeah. <laughs> You're not kidding me. So now tell us, you've been involved in the algorithmic trading for over a decade. So how's the landscape evolved and what trends do you see shaping the future for algorithmic trading and fintech? Yeah, so I started off as an algorithmic trader, basically. Um, So when I initially started trading, I was essentially building my own algorithms for the Forex markets, right? So me and my brother basically set up our own proprietary trading company. And what algorithmic trading allows you to do is that you can come in and kind of trade in a very unbiased manner, right? You're not bringing your emotions to the table. You can build, you know, algorithmic uh, trading strategies or investing strategies, which are literally trading through algorithms programmatically. What that also allows you to do is it frees up your time, right? You can, while the computer is doing its thing and the algorithms are running, you can spend that time analyzing your trades and coming up with better models. So my career started off, you know, in that space. Um, And then when I moved to India, basically the stock brokerage that I set up called Upstocks, Upstocks was also a proprietary trading company where we traded our own capital. And I was basically responsible for the algorithms for trading that capital. So basically from 2006 through 2019, I was actively involved in the algorithmic trading space. Um, Once I started trading leagues, I kind of put that behind me. So, but I think what that does is it has given me that unique perspective of 
being able to see the markets in a very kind of rational manner because you have to be very rational to trade algorithmically. Yeah. Um, but it's also some of the pain points that I've seen retail traders face when they, you know, let's say open up a Robinhood account or an Upstocks account. Um, we are directly addressing some of those pain points um, through trading leagues, you know. So I feel like trading leagues is like the next chapter of my kind of evolution as a trader. Um, but algorithmic trading has given me the fundamentals really to understand the markets in a very kind of nuanced and emotion-free manner, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, that is so super important because way back in my days, like I was trying, you know, the day trading and whatnot, and it is so hard to not get emotionally involved. Like that was the number one thing that they kept explaining to you, don't get emotionally involved, but it emotionally attached. But, you know, I remember like when they had um, paper trading where you're trading mm -hmm. like monopoly money and you know so you lost you know twenty thousand today eh, no big deal tomorrow it'll come back because well you know you know, markets are like oh of course it's up and down sure but, you know i said it and forget it let it go but now my own money i did the opposite of buy low sell high it's like you know you buy low but then the market tanks it's like oh my god you just lost five thousand dollars so you quickly get out and then the stock right. market's going back up and i get back in i'm doing the total opposite and the funny yeah. part was i forgot about the paper money and i go back to it at one point and I'd be like a millionaire at this point. And I'm right, like, exactly. Because it's not mine. And I've known people, right. they've lost their homes, they've lost their marriages. I mean, it's, it's, if you can get an algorithmic method where you're, you have to trust that it's going to do its thing and not keep your emotions out of it, you know, that's a key point because I don't know many retail investors who <laughs> are sure. good at separating, especially if it's someone else's money, they don't care. But when it's exactly. your own. I guess that so, I so what's so interesting people. about, yeah, what's interesting about that is you can do the same algorithmic trading in a paper trading environment. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, that's what, you know, that's what backtesting is called. So backtesting is literally when you build an algorithmic trading strategy and then to test it, first you test it on historical data mm -hmm. to make sure it's consistently, you know, generating profits um, on a historical basis. Once that checks out, then you take that system and you basically um, live test it, right? So you're kind of trading it without real money, right? And once it passes that phase, then you can basically deploy it, you know, using real capital. So I think for me, you know, fortunately, because I, tr I started my career doing all of that, it gave me a, a new appreciation for how easy it is to actually lose money if you don't do that, right. you know? And, um, and again, I think, I think with trading leagues, that that's actually one of the problems that we're solving because, you know, 95% of day traders lose money, yeah. right? It doesn't matter whether you're in the U S or in India, any sort of active trading market, 95% of intraday traders lose money. And it's due to exactly the reason that you outlined, right? You get scared, yeah. you trade through emotions, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a very difficult thing to really master. It's like a weird catch 22 where you can't just dive in without really knowing what you're doing, right. but then you're not going to really know what you're doing until you dive in. So exactly. it's catch 22, but like you say, yeah. get, get confidence with the paper trading, trust the algorithm and not your emotions. And, uh, you know, sets it's such on a better path. So, yeah. Now 100%. here's a different one. Scaling up, sure. scaling a proprietary trading fund from such and to an HFT enterprise. It's no small feat. So could you share some key strategies or lessons that you learned along the journey? Yeah. So I think with, um, yeah. So initially when, when I started off, you know, my, my career as an algorithmic trader, um, I was not building HFT, uh, HFT strategies, right. I was basically building, um, like the opposite of HFT. So kind of like long frequency trading, if that's a term, you know, uh, like, like a, like a buy and hold kind of a strategy. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but everything was algorithmic in nature. So there, you know, when you, when you, when you develop systems, it's more about, um, obviously thinking about risk and reward properly. Um, and understanding that you're not going to get into trades every single day, right? You might be holding on to trades for, for weeks, sometimes even months. Um, HFT is a complete opposite of that. The thing about HFT though is you're really dependent upon technology. You have to have the fastest everything. Right. I mean, that's really what HFT is all about. It's high frequency trading. Um, and the way you beat your competition is usually either by getting 
data faster than your competition or having better technology or having your servers co-located, you know, next to the exchanges, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really a, a, a very um, cutthroat kind of space to be in. So I normally would not recommend HFT to really anybody unless you right. really, really know what you're doing. And even if you know what you're doing, you're going to have to put a lot of capital into the whole process just to kind of stay afloat. But the flip side of that is that you can actually do really, really well if you have everything in place, right? So so in my case, we were, you know, knock on wood, we were fortunately um, able to do very well. Um, and we were able to kind of, you know, generate almost like a 10,000% return in two years. Those are the types of returns you can generate by using HFT strategies because you're not deploying that much capital, but your capital can quickly multiply through different types of strategies. So I think for any listeners out there, I would say avoid HFT. I mean, <laughs> read up on it. And, and there's a really great book called, um, you know, Flash Crash. Um, I forget the author's name, um, but, you know, essentially talks about how, how um, difficult it is to generate profits as a market maker or, you know, any sort of um, HFT strategy shop, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, great platforms aim to uh, democratize access to financial markets through gamification and socialization. So how do you strike a balance between education and engagement for retail investors? Yeah, so, you know, um, the, the parent company for trading leagues is called Rain Platforms. And essentially, like you said, you know, we're looking to democratize access to the financial markets. I think that term democratization gets used by a lot of companies. Everyone's trying to democratize everything. <laughs> But uh, I mean, we, we truly are trying to democratize finance. And what we mean by that is, you know, when you look at, you know, active investing rates around the world, right? Um, it's usually in the single digit percentage points. In the US, it's higher. In the US, I believe 16% of Americans actively participate with the financial markets. But in India, it is, you know, I believe 5%. Um, and in many countries, it's like between maybe three to like seven, seven or eight percent, mm -hmm. which means the large, large majority of the population is just not interested in actively participating with the financial markets. Right. And so what we're trying to do is we are actually trying to reimagine the very definition of what it means to participate. Right. Do I have to have a brokerage account in order to participate with the financial markets? So what does that even mean to participate? Right. We assume that it's you know, physically buying and selling something. But what if I'm, you know, um, playing, you know, games against other people with the real money on the line, but I'm not physically buying securities, but all the games are based upon real-time prices of stocks or cryptos or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Isn't that another form of engagement, of participation, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at companies like DraftKings and FanDuel who have done extremely well in the US and you have those types of companies all around the world. In India, there's a very successful um, real money gaming application called um, Dream 11, which is essentially the DraftKings for India. In India, everyone plays cricket, right? Mm -hmm. So Dream 11 has, I think, more than 100 million users mm -hmm. um, playing every day on Dream 11, building fantasy rosters of cricket players competing against each other with the ability to make real money as well, right? So we've taken that concept of a DraftKings or a Dream 11 and we're applying it to the financial market. So I'll give you an example, right? Uh, one of our games basically is called Selection Leagues, where you're coming in and you're building a portfolio of stocks or cryptos and you compete against other people using your portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, you might have a game where the entry fee is $2 and you're competing against, let's say, nine other people and if you win, then you win 20 bucks, right? So in that process, we're actually trying to gamify the experience of the financial markets. Um, and we're also trying to introduce elements of, so of, of, of uh, socialization as well. Because again, what, you know, as I talked about earlier, uh, you know, using traditional stock brokerages, there's very little interaction happening with people, right? So here you can actually, you know, interact with your, competitors, you can trash talk and you can do whatever mm -hmm. you want. And in that process, it induces, you know, um, elements of fun and excitement, um, which otherwise doesn't exist in the financial market. So really, we are trying to democratize the financial markets. And, and hopefully, you know, in the next few years, we can onboard, you know, millions and millions of users around the world. 
that's nice though. It's it's true yeah. because one, this isn't something they teach you in school. You know, it's it's just not. And I remember even with me, like when I first started investing, I went through a broker because I didn't even know what stocks were. I just knew it was the thing to do. You should invest. And I had a broker. And you know, unless I'm a million dollar investor, I'm not their top radar. And I'll never forget, it's like I had, you know, all my kids when they had their baptism on their birthday, my like little nest egg that they had. It's not mine to lose. I figured their babies. I mean, invested something not crazy um, risk so that when they get older, they have some money. And of course, the financial markets were tanking. The next thing I know, the money went to zero. And I called up the yeah. broker and I'm like, and he's like, well, the stocks are tanking. What do you want me to do? And I'm like, well, you could have taken it out. put it in care. Like you could have done something. But, right. you know, it's to the point, if you don't take responsibility for it, you're taking a bigger risk by relying on someone else who, like I said, unless you're a million dollar investor, you're there, you're not even on that radar. They don't care. They just put it aside and that's it. So making it right. fun and making it a way where people can learn without, I mean, $2 risk is not much at all. So giving somebody the opportunity to learn, have fun and potentially exactly. make money is huge. Which is Which is really interesting, right? Because when you think about the best ways to learn anything in life. You know, I have two kids and all they do, all they want to do is play games every day, right? <laughs> right. They, they, everything is gamified, right? Yeah. With everything they do, but that allows them to learn things the best way, right? Whether it's sports or, you know, something like chess, whatever it is, ultimately it's a game. They're not like reading books and trying to like memorize things, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I think, you know, gamifying things is, is very, very important. Also, you know, using your example, the financial advisor's interests are not completely aligned with the clients, right? The financial advisor is looking up for their own interests, which is why now you have all these DIY platforms like Robinhood, which is great, which is which is fantastic. But you know, ultimately, if I want to open up a Robinhood account, I do need to move probably hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars. And if that's my first time doing something, think about how many things we do in life where at the very first, you know, activity you're expected to move thousands of dollars, right? But that's kind of what we're expected to do with the financial markets. And then it's like one fine day, you you buy your favorite stocks, you kind of just walk away, you don't really know what you're doing. And before you know it, like you didn't use a stop loss, you don't even know what those are. Right. And you've lost like 30% of your portfolio, just like that, you know? So happens all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and I like what you said with your kids too, because making it fun, um, it'll sink in a lot more and it'll stay there. Because I remember I went to Catholic school from pre-K through high school. And it's like, you know, you had to learn it. That was it. That's your job. Learn it. There's nothing fun. But like, I remember, um, I think it was in second grade that I had to learn from the U.S. map where every state was and had to learn it by tomorrow. I was like in a panic. I, I remembered it enough to pass the test. And now it's right. a joke. And my husband says, I get lost going around the block. I'm like, I need a map. Because it never, it never stayed with it me. Doesn't, like I just, yeah, it it doesn't wasn't stick. taught to right. me in a fun way where I wanted to learn it. Say, this is interesting. Tell me more. So right. doing it in a fun way like that is, you know, it's really going to sink it a lot better than <laughs> than forcing you to learn it just because, you know. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I think, and and that's why so many apps and companies are leaning on gamification now, right? Yeah. That's a term, right? Because yeah. when you when you're enjoying what you're doing, the 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 information just sticks better. Yeah. So. Now tell us, with the rise of Web3 and decentralized finance, DeFi, how do you envision the integration of blockchain technology impacting traditional financial markets? Yeah, so again, I'm not an expert on blockchain. And, you know, with Trading Leagues, we we are a company that is crypto first, but we're not really a crypto company. We, you know, we, we get this question all the time. Mm -hmm. Are you guys a crypto company? You know, what are you exactly? Yeah. Um, so we're a crypto first company. And what that means is if you want to deposit money into your account, you have to have a crypto wallet, right? Because that allowed us to basically launch trading leagues very quickly um, with very little friction because we're a global application. So something I've not mentioned so far is that we have users from all around the country, all around the world, right? So in fact, our number one um, country in terms of users is Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So Nigerians make up about 40% of our user base and after that it's India and then it's Indonesia and you know many other countries. Um, so what that allowed us to do is it allowed us to really quickly take the product to the market and basically onboard a lot of people very, very quickly. But the requirement there is that you have to have a crypto wallet. So I come from a kind of traditional, you know, formal finance, um, 
you know, uh, background, right? Uh, in terms of, um, you know, obviously algorithmic trading and with Forex trading, et cetera, et cetera. Crypto was very, very alien to me. In fact, I resisted it and I was like, well, you know, what, what the hell is this? And I, I, I never really understood it. Right. Um, but, but, you know, as, as we launched trading leagues and we formally launched the global version only four months ago, before, you know, before that we were only operational in India, but four months ago we launched the global version of trading leagues. That's when we decided to go crypto first. I realized like the benefits of crypto is that it's truly decentralized, right? You're talking about a fully decentralized um, way of looking at money, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, you have all these solutions, you know, including, linking your, you know, your existing, um, what, you know, whether it's a MetaMask account or your, your, your MetaMask wallet or whatever it is, you can use your existing crypto wallet to move your money from your wallet to your trading leagues account. And then using that money, you can play games, right? Mm -hmm. So we're essentially crypto first from that angle. And also a lot of our games involve real-time prices of cryptos, right? So whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, all the leading cryptos, they're all listed on trading leagues. And the reason for that is very simple. Crypto is a very volatile. So when you're playing games, right, instead of playing a game where the price is barely moving and there's very little action, you can play a game involving Bitcoin, um, where obviously there's a lot of action and everyone's talking about Bitcoin these days. Um, and honestly, you know, tying this back to the earlier question, our average user spends more than one hour on the application every day. Mm -hmm. So if you're spending one hour doing anything in life every day, you're probably learning a lot, right? Whatever you're looking at, you're kind of absorbing that information like a sponge. Yeah. So our users are staring at prices of Bitcoin, Ethereum for an average of one hour every day, which you know, we feel is actually giving them a good perspective on how these things move and how much they move, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. which down the road, if they do want to invest in crypto or invest in whatever, they're going to be much better, um, you know, served, right? They're going to be much more um, confident to, to do those things down the road. So, but yeah, going back to the whole, you know, Web3 question, we're not really a Web3 company. We don't really use any blockchain technology, but that being said, from what I know and that the more I'm learning, you know, blockchain is a wonderful technology and it's essentially here to stay, you know, it's not going anywhere. So mm -hmm. I think for anyone listening to this, you know, um, I would say just kind of get with the program, you know, and, you know, really try to understand the technology um, because um, it's, 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 it's one of those kind of one directional plays that's not going anywhere, you know. Mm -hmm. That's cool what you said about uh, if they're playing with it for an hour a day, it's absorbing because if I'm not, you know, obviously hands on, you learn a lot faster. But if I just said, OK, I'm going to read the newsletters and I'm going to read the weekly update and just to get familiar with it. It's not the same. You know, I could read the news, I could see it, but I'm not studying market and seeing it every single minute. And has, but if I'm involved in doing it, well, now you got my attention and I'm going to learn it a lot better. So that's actually pretty cool. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, as a co-founder of Upstock, you've overseen its growth into one of Asia's fastest growing stock brokerages. So what leadership principles have been crucial in achieving the success? Yeah. So I think one of the early lessons for all of us, you know, I had other co-founders as well, was that distribution is key, right? You can have a great product, but if you don't have a great sales funnel, um, it's just not going to work, right? Especially when you, when you talk about um, like a B2C company like Upstocks. Um, so we had to really spend a lot of time understanding the Indian markets, understanding, you know, what's going to work, what's not going to work, um, experimenting a lot, right? and having enough capital to experiment with. So, you know, earlier I talked about how I was in charge of the algorithmic trading strategies at Upstocks, right? That was really one of my core functions. So we were pretty well capitalized all the time, right? Because the prop trading activities was generating profits and using those profits, the company had kind of capital to run different types of experiments with essentially. Um, and, you know, you have to kind of keep doing that, keep experimenting until you find the right funnels, which can scale, which are working, which are, you know, kind of resulting in net positive activity from a unit economics perspective. Right. Um, and then once you find those funnels, doubling, tripling down on those funnels, that's one major lesson. Another major lesson for me was just moving to a new country, right? Because I'm obviously from the U S I grew up in Canada and the U S and, 
you know, the move to India was not easy, right? Because I had not really lived there my entire life. I'd only visited there, you know, kind of growing up as a kid with my parents. And so I spent 10 years living there. Um, and, you know, despite whatever anyone says, when you're leaving your home country, living somewhere else, especially to set up a business, not just to live or to, you know, visit or whatever, but to set up a business um, is always challenging. And there's pros and cons associated with that, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think kind of, you know, kind of embracing that role, embracing the fact that I was not a local, right? I was actually someone from another country. I think once I embraced that identity, um, things kind of clicked, you know, and then obviously at the same time, making sure you do call that new place home to a certain extent and, you know, really ingraining yourself with all the aspects of the, of, of, of the environment. Um, yeah. And then finally, all the other kind of usual suspects, right. In terms of making sure you have the right team, you know, making sure you have all the, um, you know, right, right team members working, you know, working with you, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of lessons, but I think when you're building a B2C company like Upstocks, um, you need to make sure that everything is aligned in order to really kind of optimally, you know, execute things. Mm -hmm. no, I think it's great to mention that, um, you know, I've done lots of podcasts with people who have set up businesses or traveled and, and made their domain various different uh, countries. And it's super important because I can see the news i could read articles and blah 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 but unless you're physically on the ground living there it's not the same like i always joke about going on a tour you know visiting a country and you're in the the um you know the the travel resort that, that's mm -hmm. all cool and that's the beautiful view that they want you to see but once you get off the resort you start seeing how it really is and this way you get to see who you know because nobody every country is different every personality is different Everything is different. So really understanding who the the people are, what they like, what they don't like, what their capabilities are. Maybe they don't have the training. Maybe they don't have the technology, whatever the case may be. And tailoring it to specific audiences is huge. So it's being there 10 years. That's actually really, really good. Yeah. And, and you know, you're not going to figure it out right away. So you, you do have to have that kind of resilience to be like, okay, I'm here, mm -hmm. right? I, I'm not there. I'm over here. I'm going to stay here. And I want to figure it out, you know? So I think initially when I, when I kind of moved to India, I was kind of unsure about just my identity, right? I tried to really fit in, um, in, in almost like a fake way, right? Because I tried to kind of adopt a lot of the local customs and kind of like putting aside my, my true identity as an American. Yeah. And that doesn't work. People can see through that. So then I realized, no, it's actually better to just for me to be myself, right? Nothing is to really change and, and people accept you for who you are, you know? So, so it, it, it may sound trivial, but it's actually very, very valid, especially as an entrepreneur when you're setting up a business in a new country. So, yeah. Sure. Good job. Well, tell us, <laughs> real money gaming at eSports is a booming industry. So how do you see their intersection with financial markets and what opportunities lie ahead? Sure. So you know, I think, um, I think, I think the space is massive, right? In terms of the real money gaming industry as a whole, mm -hmm. you're talking about um, almost a $30 billion market globally. Um, and again, you know, I think we've already talked about some of the merits of real money gaming, mm -hmm. but it really does come down to kind of the hyper socialization um, and also the way we think about risk and reward, right? Like if I have a stock brokerage account, and I have a decent year, I may make maybe 15 and 20 percent on my capital, right? That's considered a good year for most people. Um, but if I'm coming in with, let's say, like a thousand dollars, for many people, like hundred dollars is not really going to move the, the, the needle that much for them, right? Yeah. Um, unless, of course, they, they're in the game for the long run. So, what this allows us to do is to really rethink the, the very definition of what it means to. Um, have a good year or whatever it is, right? If I'm coming in for, you know, with, with let's say $100 um, on a trading leaks, I can easily make hundreds of dollars. Now, obviously, most of our users are not making money because we are a negative sum, you know, um, environment, right? So, you know, we're, we're not just giving money away. Um, but at the same time, it is a skills-based activity where I can come in with a small amount of money and I can potentially make a lot of money, right? And that's the allure 
of like a DraftKings or a FanDuel or a Dream 11 or a trading leagues, right? Where you can come in with a small amount of money and you can make a lot of money. So that induces a lot of activity. And then tying that into the fact that, you know, users spend a lot of time on these applications, they end up learning a lot, you know? So I'll give you an example. You know, I was a big fan of fantasy basketball when I was in high school and also in college, right? We all fill out our March our, 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 our March Madness brackets. And just like that, you know, you have fantasy basketball for the NBA and fantasy football, et cetera, et cetera. But when you build these lineups, you're actually learning a lot about the sport, you know, uh, you know about the actual players and the teams, et cetera, et cetera. The same thing applies with trading leagues, right? When I'm basically playing on trading leagues, I'm learning a lot about the underlying asset classes. Mm -hmm. So we, we do feel that we're solving a very real need um, and obviously it's here to stay, right? I think you talked, you, you know, you asked about the growth and the future of real money gaming, real money gaming is here to stay. Uh, in fact, if you watch ESPN these days, you're going to see a lot of ads for DraftKings and FanDuel because, you know, that's really where the market's at. People do want to participate with these sports in a different mechanism. And, um, and it just, it, it makes for a very fun activity overall. I mean, I like, I like the fact that it's, it's, Investing and trading, where because I get so many pitches for like apps where, but it's gambling. It's kind of like solitaire or crossword or all of these, but they're it has nothing to do with learning anything. I mean, yeah, I'm probably the greatest solitaire queen at this point, but you're not really teaching me anything that's going to help me in life. I mean, I could go to the supermarket, play the best solitaire. It's not giving me my groceries, you know. So I like what you're just doing. It's incorporating real life, making money, but in a in a mm -hmm. learning type of way because, like you say, I mean. Living paycheck to paycheck and social security, which is almost non-existent anymore, isn't the answer. You have to invest and find a way to better your life at this point because relying on the government is not cut. But anyway, so I right. like this that it's teaching and you're learning something valuable at the same time if it's actually making good money. Yeah, and then going back to the 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 kind of usage of the term gambling, right? We do get the question a lot. You know, are you guys a gambling application? We're obviously not a gambling application and we don't, you know, need or require any sort of, you know, gambling licenses to operate trading me. So that's the easiest way to kind of address that. But the bigger aspect is, is it, you know, is it a skills based activity? Right. And I think that's very critical because if you're just talking about random luck or chance, that's a problem. Right. Because then, you know, you can say you're learning whatever, but if, if, if the outcome is dependent completely on luck, or chance, then you're not really learning anything, right? And the financial markets are ultimately driven by human beings. So there is obviously a skills human component behind the whole thing. Um, and our games try to capture that in a different way, you know? Nice. And tell us, risk, risk management is paramount in trading. So can you share some practical tips that traders, you know, to mitigate risk effectively, especially in volatile markets? Yeah, so I think as a trader, Right. One of the first risk management techniques you should learn about is stop losses. Um, that's probably the most simple way to think about risk. Um, having a stop loss gives you actually peace of mind. Right. So going back to the earlier topic of back testing and building an algorithmic trading strategy, um, I always felt that when I back tested strategies with a stop loss, my overall ROI would actually go down. Right. But what gets lost in that is that when you use a stop loss, it basically gives you peace of mind and you're not, you, you don't have to stare at your screen all day long. Right. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you have a, a fail safe mechanism. So you can use that time to basically build new strategies or just review your trades or just take a nap. Right. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so having stop losses is very important. And then money management. Right. I mean, if you have, let's say $1,000, how large should your trade be, right? Should it be for $10? You know, I would say maybe $10. That's like 1% of your capital um, and kind of going from there, right? So there's many different articles out there, resources out there to learn about risk management and money management. Those are two different topics. Um, but once you kind of get a basic understanding, then you're going to be better equipped. And it all comes down to confidence. So if you feel like you're doing something with more confidence, you're probably going to do better than someone who doesn't have that confidence. So, right. um, yeah, but I would definitely say, make sure you understand, you know, stop losses, profit objectives, and basic money management, you know? 
And given your experience, yeah. what advice would you give to investors seeking optimal returns while managing risk? And are there specific asset classes or strategies that you think? Yeah. So if you have, you know, if, if you asked me this question maybe five years ago, I would have talked about forex at length because I'm still biased towards forex. You know, I essentially spent my entire professional trading career trading forex. When I was in India, um, we're also trading Indian stocks, but that's not really applicable for Americans. Um, you have to be in India to do that. But if you're asking me now, I would say crypto. You know, because there's so much volatility and you want to chase volatility. That's really what the whole thing comes down to. If there's one thing that you want to look for, you want to look for a volatile asset class. If you're looking to kind of partake in short-term trading, right? If you're looking to like build a long-term portfolio, maybe, maybe not right with cryptos, even there though. I mean, there's, there's really nothing wrong with investing long-term into cryptos, but then you have to kind of take that volatility into account. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, I think cryptos is a great kind of asset class to partake in for just gen uh, general day trading, um, because of the volatility, but definitely spend some time understanding the asset class, right? So, I mean, if I were you just open up a trading lease account and, <laughs> you know, start spending time on trading leagues because you're going to be understanding the nuances of Bitcoin and all these cryptos pretty well, actually. And once you get a pretty good understanding of the movement, um, come up with a basic trading strategy, right? I mean, coming back to tying this back to algorithmic trading, it doesn't have to be an actual algorithmic strategy, but you can come up with a rules-based system, which you can deploy on your own, right? Mm -hmm. You can just open up a stock brokerage account. You can use basic technical indicators or some sort of system based on fundamentals and you can start using rules towards making your trading decisions um, and then set conservative expectations, right? Don't expect to make maybe 40, 50% a year because then you're probably trading something that's not going to work long-term. Mm -hmm. So maybe something that's just beating the, you know, industry average um, and then try to have fun. I think, yeah. you know, I think when we, you know, when, when we do enjoy what we're doing, I think it leads to a better outcome. So, yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, financial management education, that's crucial. So how can we better prepare aspiring traders and investors for the complexities of today's markets? Yeah, so I'm not super well-versed with, you know, the leading resources for education. Um, but off the top of my head, I know that, you know, when you open up a stock brokerage account, they will have some resources available to you, usually in, in forms of just, getting educated, right? Whether it means an education comes in different ways. It's also about the markets. It's also about the platform you're using. Mm -hmm. So understanding your platform and then again, you know, spending time on different types of websites um, and trying to, you know, I've always been a fan of the brokers who do provide education. So, you know, my brother used to work for um, a company called Thinkorswim and they essentially, you know, eventually became um, TD Ameritrade. Um, so Ameritrade, I'm sure, has a very comprehensive education section. Again, I'm not super, you know, knowledgeable on on exactly which resources to use, mm -hmm. but your stockbroker should have some resources some resources available when it comes to these things. Um, and yeah, just again, you know, spend a lot of time. Like when I when I started off as a trader, I spent almost an entire year doing nothing but just reading up online, right? Reading up and trying to figure out. What is it that I understand? What makes sense to me? Um, and that's when I kind of discovered the world of algorithmic trading and then I started building systems, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, kind of um, finding your calling and finding what makes sense to you and then kind of just reading up about it more and more and more and then experimenting and then kind of going from there, you know? Yeah, no, that's important. Knowledge is power <laughs> because it's true. Um, yeah. I remember Thinkorswim, that was one of the first platforms I had and they had a lot of... Um, that's where I had my paper paper trading account, but it also had mm -hmm. a lot of tutorials because like I said, if I just put all my faith in a broker, you've kind of taken a chance just in that in and of itself, forget about the stocks. <laughs> right. And yeah, and, and Thinkorswim was was known for that. In fact, they had an entire section just dedicated towards education. And their founder was, I mean, I'm sure he still is, um, was all about education and content and um and when my brother worked there they had an entire like their office was set up in such a way where 
They had an, you know, one half of the office was just dedicated towards education, having courses, online, offline courses. So it's very powerful, right? And you get to actually meet people there as well, which is all, also very, very um, beneficial. So, yeah, I mean, you definitely you want to know what it is you're trading, but you also want to know the platform because it's not like I'm trading on a platform and I didn't know where the button was and now the stock tank. But because I didn't know where the button was, they need to refund you that money. That stock market don't work that way. So <laughs> you don't right. want to do it your job. <laughs> right. Zero refund policy, right? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> So now looking ahead, what legacy do you hope to leave in the financial industry? And how do you envision your impact on future generations of traders and entrepreneurs? Yeah, that's that's a, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, I've never really thought about that. I mean, hopefully, you know, when it's all said and done, um, I would have helped move that needle a little bit in terms of uh, active participation rates, right? Because obviously right now, like I talked about earlier, most most people that we know do not actively engage with the financial markets, right? There is that kind of catch 22 that kind of inherently almost exists. It's like, you know, again, without knowledge, you're not going to do something, but then without doing something, you're not going to accumulate knowledge. So hopefully with trading leagues, we at least get people to rethink the definition of what it, what it means to participate with the financial markets. And we get people to think about the markets as a place where you can actually have fun. You can, meet people which sounds so weird <laughs> and um you know and and if we can get you know a decent number of people to do that around the world then that would be like a pretty cool kind of thing to leave behind you know now anything else you want to add that we didn't talk about or that you're working on no so i think i think um i think you know i think we we, we obviously discussed a lot i think the financial markets are awesome and mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I always try, <laughs> 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 and I'm always trying to tie things back to my kids. And you know, in fact, kids are like almost like great guinea pigs to kind of try different things on. You know, when it comes to like business and trying to see like what sticks and what doesn't stick. Mm -hmm. And one thing I've always found is that when you know when your kids are having fun, they learn things really cool. You know, re re really quickly, um, and and things kind of stick. So we're trying to take some of those same elements and you know, apply towards the financial markets. And I guess we'll see how things kind of play out in the long run. Now, how could people learn more about you or get in touch with you? Yeah. So basically I'm on Twitter, you know, my hashtag is um, Ragu underscore trading leagues. So that's my first name, R-A-G-H-U underscore trading leagues. Um, and uh, other than that, you can also find me on LinkedIn. You know, I think if you search for me, you're going to find me on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, yeah, those are basically my two major social profiles. And if people want to get in on this uh, this game, how do they find that? That's right. Our website is tradingleagues.app. So that's tradingleagues.app. And the entire application is web-based. So you just have to come in, register using your social logins. You can use Google. Um, I think we support um, a couple others as well, but most, most of our users just use our Google logins to log in and Facebook as well. Um, and then you can go ahead and sign up. It's free to sign up and we have free games and paid games. If you want to play a paid game, you know, obviously you need to deposit money, but you can get started by playing free games. Um, and it's a great fun way to experience cryptos, stocks and Forex. And we'll be introducing other asset classes, in, in, you know, in the very near future. Very, very nice. Well, thank you again for being on the show. Again, that was Raghu Kumar. So thanks for listening to Success by Minds with Patty B. Never miss an episode by subscribing to the channel. So thank you so much again. Thank you so much, Patricia. I really my appreciate the uh, opportunity. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for listening to Successful Minds with your host, Patricia Barnowski Schneider. Please leave your feedback and visit strategicadvisorboard.com to get the latest and greatest business advisement on the planet. Follow us on social media for updates, and we'll see you on the next episode.